the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. It was caused by the massive tsunami triggered by the Tohoku earthquake on March 11, 2011. Flooding from seawater damaged cooling systems needed to keep the reactors from overheating. This in turn caused three radioactive meltdowns and the widespread release of radioactive material. This was a level seven nuclear event comparable only to Chernobyl. If you want to know more about specifically the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, the event that caused this nuclear crisis, please check out my last 10 things you didn't know video. All right, Fukushima, 10 things, let's get into it. The Fukushima nuclear disaster was essentially a man-made disaster, despite the earthquake and tsunami. You had poor organizational and regulatory systems in place, an overly cozy relationship between government and industry that resulted in shady practices. Also, ingrained conventions of Japanese culture, which many find quite appealing, was actually a detriment during the crisis, inducing slow and inefficient decision-making. In fact, before the disaster even happened, there were industry experts who warned of mega tsunami generating earthquakes hitting the area every eight to 1,100 years, with the next one being overdue. They made clear action needed to be taken to avoid a nuclear catastrophe. But those in charge dismissed such warnings, insisting tsunami heights based off a 9th century old earthquake wasn't worth considering. It was never gonna happen. During the crisis at Fukushima, high radiation levels at the plant made it desperately hard for human workers to do what they needed to do. The US sent robots to assist them, but they were of limited speed and range. They weren't really that good. What they really needed were functional radiation resistant robots with a full range of motion. You'd think they'd have those in Japan, but they don't. Well, not anymore. Back in 2001, the Japanese had actually developed extremely capable robots that were deemed technical successes. But then a government task force, which included some familiar faces, concluded that a Chernobyl scale disaster was never gonna happen in Japan. The robots were unnecessary. The program was shut down and the robots were dismantled or donated. That was a mistake. The Onagawa nuclear power plant was the closest power plant to the earthquake epicenter, half the distance of Fukushima Daiichi, yet it successfully withstood the barrage. While the Fukushima plant had seawalls up to 5.7 meters, Onagawa had it up to 14 meters, preventing serious damage and radioactive releases. The funny thing is, while in Fukushima, everyone was trying to get as far away as possible from the nuclear plant, in Onagawa, residents who lost their homes were taking refuge at the nuclear plant. Hundreds of thousands of people within 20 to 30 kilometers of the Fukushima complex were evacuated. Unfortunately, due to miscommunication between the evacuation authorities and the experts who were analyzing the fallout, many residents were evacuated from pretty safe areas right into the radioactive plume. Here's a sad fact. More people were killed by the evacuation process in Fukushima than by the actual earthquake and tsunami, the disaster itself. People died of fatigue, exhaustion, illness, suicides, losing their homes, not knowing where they'd end up, cramped evacuation centers. The whole ordeal was taxing. Actually, there would have been way less casualties if residents never even evacuated, despite the radiation. After the Fukushima disaster, random radiation hotspots were discovered in unexpected locations, mainly due to drainage or gutter issues. Radiation levels as high as those in the no-go zone were detected as far as some Tokyo suburbs. We're talking about really small concentrated hotspots here, not mass irradiation of cities. But still, that can be a serious cause for concern, which prompted many Japanese residents to take up a new hobby. No, not tennis or stamp collecting, but walking with Geiger counters through their city or village in search for random radiation levels to report, like searching for gold. 55-year-old Naoto Matsumura is the only man brave enough to live in Fukushima's no-go zone. After the initial evacuation, he returned back to take care of the animals that were left behind. Not just his animals, but everyone's. Many were left chained up by their owners or locked up in barns, frantically abandoned in the radioactive aftermath. He let them all go. They now roam freely on the streets of what can only be described as post-apocalyptic Fukushima. Like something out of I Am Legend. If you look at Fukushima today, wow, it really looks like the set of The Walking Dead. Anyway, the government has actively tried to stop Matsumura from staying within the contaminated city, but he pretty much ignores them. In his mind, he has to stay. He knows the animals have no one else to rely on 
for food. He's aware of the harmful effects of the radiation, but he refuses to worry about it. He says, they told me I wouldn't get sick for 30 or 40 years. I'll most likely be dead by then anyway, so I couldn't care less. Some people think the radiation levels were so bad that mutations and deformities were going on left and right, which isn't true. But there were a few small-scale discoveries in the aftermath, such as mutated trees, deformed daisy flowers, though these can occur in nature as well, DNA-damaged worms, not so much mutations, but radioactive tuna, only trace amounts though, cows with random white spots, mutated butterflies. Actually, that last one was most surprising to scientists because insects are believed to be very resistant to radiation. Add to that, these mutations were passed down through generations, starting with butterflies that existed at the time of the Fukushima incident. So they were inherited mutations. We saw some horrific things at Chernobyl, acute radiation syndrome, deformities, death, Nothing like that happened at Fukushima, despite the perception of some. No one died from radiation exposure. And contrary to a well-publicized yet poorly executed study that made the rounds in 2015, thyroid cancer rates in Fukushima children were actually lower than the national average. Naoto Kan, Japan's prime minister during the crisis, revealed at one point Japan faced a situation where it was possible that people might no longer have been able to live in the capital, where tens of millions of people would have been forced to flee Tokyo. Japan's densely populated eastern seaboard could have been left uninhabitable. The nation's existence could have been threatened. Okay, this all sounds like a bit of an exaggeration, but maybe not, because it kind of almost happened. Masao Yoshida was the manager of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. And on March 15, 2011, four days into the nuclear crisis, he led a brave group, now dubbed the Fukushima 50, into the radioactive trenches. These were the remaining plant employees who chose to stay and risk their lives amidst high radiation levels to bring the overheated reactors under control. Now, with cooling systems crippled and having run out of fresh water, Yoshida decided they would pump seawater straight from the ocean into the damaged reactors, but he was running out of time. Then in a scene reminiscent of 24, corporate headquarters ordered him to stop the seawater injection. Yeah, them again. They didn't want corrosive seawater to permanently damage their reactors. They'd lose a lot of money. Feeling his superiors were inept for risking a colossal radioactive fallout, Yoshida disobeyed the direct order and continued with a seawater injection. Many experts now agree that his actions on that day arguably prevented a much greater catastrophe, one that former Prime Minister Naoto Kan feared would become a reality. After the crisis was over, Yoshida was reprimanded by TEPCO execs for his disobedience. But I guess it didn't really matter because to most, he was hailed as a hero. In a culture where people are super reluctant to question authority, Yoshida stood out to his peers as different, a strong-minded individual not afraid to go against the grain. And as a result, he saved a lot of people. I hope you all enjoyed that video. Uh, I certainly enjoyed making it. Don't forget to check out my 10 things you didn't know about the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami video if you haven't already. I'll also link some of my other 10 things videos on the side if you're interested. All right, please give this a thumbs up, comment, share. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. And for more Asian-y videos, don't forget to subscribe.